Heights today. We have some beautiful flowers back here. This is from the Daniel J. Carey Memorial that we had yesterday. Uh, it's a family that were good friends with uh, Pastor Oliver Northcott. They grew up next to them and uh, they have fond memories being here at the church for many activities with the Northcott family. And it was great to be able to be a part of that for the family. Um, also, there's new daily breads out in the foyer. And uh, I want to take an opportunity again to thank somebody that does an awful lot for us, and that's Darren. Um, in the filming and everything like that, and singing, and you know, when we were closed for COVID, he and I came and we did things to be put on the internet, times of worship for people, and uh, really appreciate it. Um, also want to say, tomorrow's his birthday. <laughs>
cross, but we're going to sing it today because we are celebrating communion, the power of the cross. <laughs>
see our needs and you fill our needs. And Lord, you give us an abundance of what we need. <clears throat> Thinking about living in this country that we do, the freedoms that we have, the materials, goods that we have. Lord, you have blessed us in such a way that we get the opportunity to imitate you through our giving. And we thank you that we can. And we thank you for the faithful givers who support this ministry by spreading your love. In Jesus' name, amen. The longer I serve him, Draw us all to yourself. 
And Lord, as we pray, we pray for an end to that violence. The looting in cities like Portland, Minneapolis, Lord, other cities around the country, our nation's capital especially. Would you stop those who are stirring up racial tension and violence with their words, their acts, and bring us healing as a nation. Cause our national leaders to stop promoting division and instead to encourage unity. Give them wisdom, discernment, passion as they rule this nation. That they do it for the people, not for themselves, not for their pocketbooks. May they be turned to you for your guidance and your strength. Lord, we continue to pray for churches across the country to be open. For your praises to be heard across this land. Lord, in a sense, for there to be a revival of bringing people back to yourself. Lord, as we come, we pray always for the healing for those who are hurting. This morning, we think of uh, Jerry Greenlaw as he's driving back from Maine. And we understand he's in a lot of pain over his knee and shoulder and some other issues. Lord, we just lift him up to you for his safety and his well-being. Would you give the doctor's wisdom regarding his treatment? Lord, as we pray too, we pray for others who are going through similar situations. Lord, those who are preparing for surgeries. We just trust them to you. Would you hand me upon each one? Lord, you know who's here today, who's having issues. Lord, give doctors wisdom regarding our treatments. Lord, we pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We think especially of Daniel Carey's family this morning. Seven brothers and sisters, two sons, families. Lord, we lift them to you. Pour out your grace, your comfort, your strength. Lord, we pray that as the gospel was heard, the funeral service, Lord, that it will touch lives, especially the lives of the young ones in that family. Lord, we pray for all those who grieve the loss of loved ones. Lord, we pray. For churches to grow like ours, we want our church to be one that's making a difference for you. We pray we lift our future to you. We place it in your hands. We pray we ask it all in Jesus' name.
stand and sing again. We will glorify.
And Proverbs 22, 4 says, True humility and fear of the Lord leads to riches, honor, and long life. That raises the question of our motivation for whatever work we do, whether it's for pay or for volunteer, any kind of work. Hopefully it's not just for the pay. Yes, God doesn't expect us to work for nothing. <clears throat> he blesses us with jobs. That's how he helps provide for us. But it should be more for our motivation than just that. We should show up at work not just for a paycheck. It will be obvious in our work to those we work with and for. Because who wants an employee who doesn't really care about his work? Same way, we don't want to go to a doctor who looks at the pain in your side that you're complaining of as a down payment on his new Lexus. We want to go to a doctor who wants to make us healthy, right? Suggesting money alone is never good. It's never an adequate motivation for the work we do or how we do it. Nor is self-promotion. We all work with people who are overly ambitious, who just want to get ahead more than they want to do the job. I mean, such people like that can cause a lot of problems in an organization simply because they always want to blame their mistakes on others. They cut corners in order to make deadlines. And worse, they often try to steal credit for what others have achieved. And that always stirs up problems within an organization. These are people who don't know the meaning of teamwork. And regardless of how high up the ladder these people go, they're never satisfied. And chances are, as they've gone up the ladder, they've hurt people. So that as they begin to call back down that ladder, it's never a comfortable thing for them. It's painful. But all this does raise the motivation. What our motivation should be as believers, right? In all that we do, the scriptures teach that is a way to look at it all as an opportunity to serve the Lord. Instead of looking at work as a curse, we should look at all that we do, not something just to make money, but as something we do for Jesus. It's something we do for Jesus. As Colossians 3.23 says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. You know, talking about motivation, George Moore wrote about some Irish immigrants who found jobs during the Great Depression. They were so thrilled. They found work building a road that they started singing as they labored. Until they discovered that the road they were building led to nowhere. That's right. They were told that as soon as the government funding for the project ran out, the work would stop, the road unfinished. Well, once they discovered that, they began listless began becoming listless in their work. They stopped singing. As J. Wallace Hamilton said, the roads to nowhere are difficult to build. For a man to work well, to sing as he works, there must be an end in view. And for Christians, that end in view, if you will, that takes the drudgery out of our work, is that what we do, we do for the Lord. As Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. A second principle of what you could call a Christian work ethic, of course, is that we strive for excellence. We strive for excellence. Because when Solomon asked, Proverbs 22, 29, do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. Scholars tell us what he was alluding to was how believers strive for excellence in all that they do. Because they feel the work that they do should reflect the one they serve. It should reflect the glory of the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And that's a stark contrast to the attitude many people have today at their work. They want to do just as little as possible, just enough to get by and to keep their jobs. I mean, how many times have you been on a work site and heard somebody say, eh, good enough for government work? times have you said it yourself? Christians should always think if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing well. Especially as Paul called believers God's workers. 
1 Corinthians 3 9. For in the NIV, we are fellow workers with Christ. Think about that. As Dallas Willard said, believers should always put forth their best effort in everything, whether it's making axe handles or tacos, whether it's selling cars or teaching kindergarten, engaging in investment banking or holding political office, evangelizing or running a Christian ed program. Performing the arts or teaching English as a second language. Because he went on, our work is of central interest to God. And he wants it done well. It's work that should be done. It should be done as Jesus himself would do it. Nothing is more important than doing the job of sweat and intelligence and the power of God. This is our devotion to God. As Willard's words reflect exactly what Paul said in what we read earlier from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Chapter 7, I mean verse 7, work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. The good news in verse 8 is because the Lord rewards. He rewards each one of us for the good we do. So whatever you do with an attitude of serving the Lord will never be in vain. He sees it. It brings him glory, and you can use it, use it for your gain. Like how striving to present the best vacation Bible school programs we could. Previous churches I pastored, Minnesota, New York State. They had had VBS programs before, but they'd always been attended just by people in the church, the families in the church. No outside people at all. But we gave it livelier music. We made the adults dress up in costumes. We had some great big decorations, the themes. We brought in one theme, you know, snowmobiles for the kids to sit on, canoes for them to sit in, that type of thing. We made it more exciting. The word got out after the first day. And pretty soon we found we had a lot of unchurched kids. And there's no telling to this day how memories of that program have affected the faith of those children. We did it for the Lord. And Paul said God rewards people for the work they do. He didn't mean we should go out and try and do good things so we can earn his favor. So we can earn his goodwill. He just said as a general rule, when you do things for the Lord, when you do good, he blesses us. How? John Killinger recounts that when he was traveling the English countryside, he saw an old faded out sign ancient barn. Simply read Bellow and Son Makers, Levenston. And he thought that was kind of interesting. Didn't say what Bellow and Sons made, but he said, you know, how proud father and son must have been when that sign was first put up. That they worked together as makers. And really, that's the blessing we have as believers. We're God's fellow workers, fellow workers with Christ, so that we can think of our relationship with the Lord as God and Son makers. And that's a beautiful song, as God calls us to partner with Him in His work in the world. So even if an employer doesn't reward you for doing your best, God sees, and He does reward you. You're working for Him. And that leads to another principle. Again, Christian work ethic, and that's that we practice diligence. Diligence, it's a stick with itness to the job. A believer doesn't abandon a task he's committed to just because he finds it to be harder than he thought it would be. Or just because, oh, it's turned out to be boring, it's not fun. No, he keeps his commitments, he follows through, he endures till the job is done. And we should never confuse diligence or excellence with perfection. Only God is perfect. But the best way to think about excellence is to think God expects us to do the best of what he's blessed us with and to be diligent. You know, that reminds me, I had dinner once with Carl Ripken Jr. Remember the baseball great? This was before he was inducted to the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. But when he was, I read about him, and I 
fellow that sponsored him said, you know, we're not nominating Cal, Carl, to put him in the Hall of Fame because he was the best to ever play shortstop or third base. And we're not really doing it because he had over 3,000 hits in his career. He said, we're doing it because he was there all the time, putting out his best effort. Occasionally, his play was brilliant, but he was always diligent. And that's important. You read how the NIV version of Proverbs 12, 24 says, Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in slave labor. If you're employed, you slack off, it's going to be noticed. Co-workers, those you work for, quality of your work, and how much you do. And here's the thing, you never know who's watching. Howard Stein tells a story of a retired friend who became interested in building of a building near his home. And he was retired, he had plenty of time. He would walk down often and watch the construction workers. And he found interesting, particularly uh, a guy that was running heavy machinery, a heavy piece of machinery, how very careful he was in his work, how particular he was in the things that he did. So much so that one day he was walking by, he happened to see this construction worker walk, walking into the site. And he stopped and he complimented him. And the fellow looked at him with astonishment and said, do you mean you're not the supervisor on the job? He thought he was being observed. You never know who's watching. Folks, a paycheck is never entitlement. It's always something you earn. But whether you're employed or you're just volunteered to do something, you know, like working at ODCK, open door community kitchen, and helping prepare and serve the meals, here, the soup kitchen. People see what we do, and as a believer, we reflect the God we serve in how we serve. Is it with joy? Are we doing it with our best effort? Or are we doing what we're doing grudgingly? Just putting in our time. Some of you may have heard of Harry Ironside, who's probably the most prolific Christian writer of the last century, wrote over 80 books, had a radio program, Bible study program, wrote commentaries, pamphlets. Well, anyway, he tells a story of growing up and working for a cobbler. And his particular job was to cut out the piece of leather that went on the sole of the shoe. And you would wet it. And then you would take a hammer and you would hammer it out. And finally you would use iron to dry it completely before it would be sewed onto the bottom of the shoe. Well, one day he happened to be passing another cobbler. And he watched him work for a while. And a fellow happened to take that same piece of leather, which used as a sole, out of the water, he immediately started to hammer it onto the bottom of a shoe. I mean, it was so wet, he said, when you pounded in the nails, you could see the water squirting out. So he asked the man, well, does it make any difference? Putting it on wet versus drying it out, ironing it out, pounding it out? And the fellow replied to him, well, they come back for repair all that much quicker, don't they? Well, Ironside thought he had learned something. So he went back to the cobbler he worked for. And he suggested he might do the same thing. Put the soles leather on wet. At this point, the cobbler stopped the work. He went over and he got out his Bible. And he opened it up and he asked Ironside to read it. And he read from 1 Corinthians 10.31, where it said, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And he said, Harry, I don't cobble shoes for work, or really for my customers. I cobble shoes for the Lord. Some people are called to preach. Some are called to fix shoes. And I have this vision that come judgment day, all the shoes I've ever worked on are going to be piled up there. And God's going to be standing there looking through them, saying, Whoa, this is pretty shoddy work. When what I want him to say is, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Then he went on to explain that only as he did his work well would his testimony count for God. 
Just doing enough to get by is not good enough for God. And as said earlier, work is never a curse. Solomon also wrote Ecclesiastes. And there in verse chapter 3, verse 22, he said, there's nothing better for people than to be happy in their work. Earlier in verse 13, same chapter, he said, enjoy the fruits of your labor, for these are gifts from God. Steve Alford played professional basketball. Dallas Mavericks, Golden State Warriors. He was on the 1992 Olympic Dream Team with Michael Jordan. And he admits, he said, you know, there was a great difference in ability between Jordan and the rest of us on the team. But what really impressed him was every practice, Jordan was the first on the court and always the last to leave. And he learned that Jordan had a clause in his contract for the Bulls that he played for for so long. It was an enjoyment of the game clause. What that meant was they couldn't prevent him from playing any pickup game he wanted to play in. He loved the game that much. Most teams won't allow that because they don't want a chance that players getting hurt. But not Jordan. And while some might say it's easy to find satisfaction in a job like playing basketball, it's a great way to make a living. But I push a pencil, I drive a truck, I paint houses, I lift boxes all day. What's satisfying about that? Every job, even shooting hoops, making movies up in Hollywood, has a certain amount of drudgery to it. But it's really not about the job we do, it's about the attitude that we bring to it. If you want to find satisfaction in a job well done, look at everything you do, whether it's for pay, volunteering, or just the things you do around your home. Do it for the Lord. If you want to be satisfied, work for the Lord. He'll value and use what you do, whether it's for pay or volunteering, to bring Him glory. And always to help you become the person He wants you to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may all that we do, every word from our mouth, reflect your glory. Thank you for blessing us with work. And knowing that you partner with us in all that we do, whether it's on a job, whether it's here at church, whether it's just something we do at home, as you are with us at all times, you partner with us. And may all that we do bring you glory. As others who are not believers would see what we do and ask the reason why we might strive for excellence. And we would have the opportunity of sharing the blessed name of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We invite you to the table today. We invite you to stand up and let's sing together in remembrance of him.
center aisle, take the elements, and go back on the outer aisles. And please stop to come. Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room. He 
took a cup of wine and he gave thanks. He gave it to them. He said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again till the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Again, the cup that Jesus raised, as we get to partake in it, it reminds us that we will get to participate in the big feast yet to come. It will be served to all who have gone before us, believing in Jesus. We get to be a part of that with Abraham, Moses, Noah. Many of us are parents, our friends. As Jesus said, take, this represents a new covenant. My blood poured out for you, the covenant of grace. Let us drink the remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your blood for us. It gives us forgiveness for our sins. As you drank the cup of God's wrath, God's anger, so that we could drink of this cup of God's salvation. We can only praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. She <coughs> says that after Jesus celebrated with the disciples, that they stood and they sang a song before they went out. As we been speaking today about bringing glory to the Lord. It's only fitting that we end our service today by standing to sing glorify thy name.